you for joining us on The Spin Room. I'm your host, Ami Kaufman. Our three spin doctors today are editor at the Gatestone Institute, Ruthie Bloom, social and political activist, Wad Khatib, researcher and author of The War of Return, Adi Schwartz. It is good to see all three of you. Thank you for coming on the show. Our four topics of discussion today with our esteemed guests are a senior Hamas official admits that 50 of the 61 Palestinians killed on Monday near the security fence between Gaza and Israel were members of Hamas. We'll then discuss how Israeli-Turkish ties are spiraling out of control. Afterwards, we'll discuss the reaction in the Arab society inside Israel to the latest events. And time willing, we'll end with yet another embassy opening late today in Jerusalem, just 48 hours after the historic relocation of the American mission, this time Guatemala. Okay, our first topic is the situation in Gaza and its border with Israel after the violent events on Monday, resulting in the deaths of 61 Palestinians. Reports have surfaced that Hamas has sent a message to Israel offering to limit the number of protesters at the Gaza border in return for Israel easing off its airstrikes on Hamas positions in the Strip. Israel has warned that it may resume its policy of targeted killings of Hamas leaders if the violence continued. And a somewhat dramatic development in the past few hours, a senior Hamas official has announced that 50 of its members were amongst the 61 killed. Meanwhile, Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman had the following to say about the Hamas leadership. I want to emphasize again, the Hamas leadership are a bunch of cannibals that treat their own children as weapons. There are rocket weapons, personal weapons, and there is another type of weapon, which is children or women. Let's start with this uh, statement by this Hamas, ofi Hamas official saying that 50 of the people killed, of those, of those 61 killed on Monday, uh, were part of the organization. Doesn't that mean that these protests were, A, not peaceful, and two, orchestrated by Hamas? What? Well, uh, this is actually the first time I hear about that, but uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that they are indeed affiliated with Hamas. Uh, at the end, they are unarmed people that were shot at and killed by the Israeli soldiers. So whether they are affiliated with Hamas or not, uh, they, were, they didn't carry any arms. They, not even a single bullet was fired from the Palestinian side to the Israeli side, mm -hmm. and yet more than 60 people were killed, including children. Mm -hmm. So are those children affiliated with Hamas as well? The answer is definitely not. Ruthie. Uh, first of all, those children were brought there by their parents, and uh, Hamas sent them there, and Iran sent Hamas there. So to say that children were killed and all that, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. So that is justified to kill them? Um, when you have a violent assault, you say it wasn't violent. It actually was violent. They had lots of weapons. So um, the children, they were, did the children have weapons? No, the children didn't have no. weapons. The children were the weapons. Why were they killed by the Israeli soldiers? Uh, they were brought there okay. to be killed right. so that Hamas could say that Israel kills children. Okay, let's move to Adi. Let's weigh in. Yeah, I think that it doesn't really matter if it's Hamas or Fatah. I think we have to look at the bigger picture. It's not a coincidence that these events are much of return. It's not about the closure, it's not about independence or statehood, it's about the return. And we have to remember that the main goal of these people is to cross the border and to regain what they perceive as their ancestral land, which is the whole of the land from the river to the well, sea. Well, they weren't in that, in, when they were going to cross the border, if they succeeded, but they weren't exactly going to, you know, they weren't coming with suitcases and going, you know, to re go to their homes in Ashkelon in the south of the country. There, there was, it, it was a protest right there, wasn't it? Well, we tend to minimize and we think that what's obvious to us is obviously obvious for them. Mm -hmm. But yes, this is the most uh, fundamental ethos and narrative of the Palestinians. They lost the war in 1948, but they didn't give up their claim for the land. Yeah. And they still see the state of Israel as an unjustified, as a colonial project that they will never agree to. You know, the Israeli daily, uh, Israel Hayom, reported today that Ismail Haniya, the leader of Hamas, was brought to Egypt to be reprimanded there and humiliated. He was even screamed at according just to Israel Hayom. Uh, what do you make of this development? Could this be the reason of this announcement by, the, by this uh, Hamas official to show that Hamas, Hamas trying to show basically that it was not sending civilians, it was sending its own people, Ruthie? Yes, for sure if he's acknowledging that 50 members of those 60 were Hamas members, yeah. Um, it certainly wasn't to appease the international media that had been screaming that all these poor civilians are being killed. Mm. Um, if so, what he was doing is saying, uh, no, actually, they were soldiers, not civilians. Uh, and Hamas uh, keeps talking out of two sides of its mouth during okay. this whole thing. What, what exactly was Israel supposed to do to stop thousands of people at the fence 
from crossing over. Isn't that exactly what any sovereign country would do if there were thousands of people trying to cross over? Okay, let me please first relate to what uh, he said. Uh, okay, indeed they were protesting, but not, not they didn't only demand the right of return. We are talking about people of Gaza who, who live in a large prison. They live in a ghetto, in a concentration camp where people die of hunger, of shortage of medicine, of shortage of food. 90% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable. 50% uh, unemployment, 30% Fifth. And now to the question four, about the, okay, the crossing. I'm, I'm coming to that. Only four hours of electricity a day. Can yes. you imagine living with that? Okay. So they did indeed want to return. But at the point where they tried indeed to cross the border, was the solution to shoot, for, to kill? I mean, mm -hmm. we've seen footage by the Israeli soldiers showing them killing people who were at a distance from them and they were crying jubilantly after they killed it, each and every one of them. You can so react to that. You could, yeah. sorry, just yeah, uh, go ahead for, quickly. So you could neutralize them by shooting them in the legs. Why killing by shooting okay. in the head? There's a question. Why not shoot in the legs? Why not use uh, water cannons or more tear gas? Uh, you know, in the West Bank, I've seen uh, riots dispersed without necessarily using live ammunition, some rubber bullets. Why, why, why is it like this idea? Well, my expertise is not military, but I would like to answer to your question because you're right. It's a very good question. The situation in Gaza is obviously not great, but the question you have to ask yourself is why? By now, the Gaza Strip has received billions of dollars of aid, and the question is why is it that the population of Gaza chooses to put its money into tunnels into Israel and not to build their schools, their homes, etc. And the answer is that the international community has maintained for 70 years the status of refugees in the Gaza Strip unjustifiably and these people think that their situation is temporary. What does it mean to have today refugees in Gaza? Where are they going to return? They want to return to Ashkelon okay, and Ashdod. But I, I, want that is answer, the I want you and Ruthie to answer basically the question that I asked okay. you about how to stop people from crossing the border is live ammunition the only way if I were a Palestinian I would certainly want Israel to use live ammunition on all my leaders and on all of Hamas members because those people the, the way you that's you not what I asked though I live, asked about the people no, at the fence but the people on the fence the whole purpose of this was to use civilians to try to break through the fence and then terrorists would go through the fence once it was broken but through. wasn't there any and other Israel way to stop them from doing that thwarted a whole group of us a terrorist cell that was about to do that. Why not shoot okay. them in the legs? Why kill them? Actually, why a disabled, said, kid, a disabled guy was killed, although he was about a kilometer far from the soldiers. He was killed. He was shot in the head. He's disabled. He can't even cross. Why was he killed? The truth is that I wasn't there, and therefore I don't know what kind of situation it is. It's a very oh, menacing. It's a menacing situation when you are being stormed okay. by thousands. Of I want to. I want to show you something that was written today by uh, Amos Harel, the military uh, pundit uh, analyst. I say uh, in the hearts as well as a left-wing broadsheet. Like with a push of a button, and certainly on orders from on high, almost all of the weapons fire on, board, on border with the Gaza Strip was halted on Tuesday. The day after that, we're talking about it was a lot more calm. He's saying uh, the violence was substantially curbed as a matter of decision. That Hamas made a decision to, to lower uh, the flames. Could one say, uh, also, all of you, that Israel actually, in a way, succeeded in getting its message Absolutely. across? That this is, you know, it, it's not worth it. By killing people. Yes, and that's what I'm saying, <laughs> yes. basically. That's which what I'm is, saying. Which is ironic. I mean, yeah. is that the type of solution you want? To stop protests by killing people? Answer that, yeah. Um, Yes, because actually those people were killed by Hamas. But That's the point. On, the point is, on, no, the point is that you need so to So if, if Arabs inside Israel protest and uh, uh, assert different. the right uh, to protest, and they, 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 do, they don't agree to go home, and then the solution is to kill them? That's okay. different. That's, That's completely the different. They were we protesting. 20 seconds before we go for a break. Really different. Quickly. Well, in my view, the whole situation is absurd. That's not a fence. It's an international border. And when 40,000 people... Even if it's an international border, wouldn't it be a real state? That doesn't matter what's the status. The sta it's Why not does fence. it matter? Why it's, it matter? it's not a state. Because there is no other state on earth that would accept that 40,000 people, even if they were naked, would come and trust, try to cross the border. That's impossible. Okay, but it, is it right to say that it is an international border when it's not really a, a state recognized by the international community? I don't know any <laughs> other country that would allow that. That's okay. absurd. Okay. We have to go for a commercial break. We'll be right back with Adish Farz, Moad Khatib, and Ruti Bloom. Don't go away.
We're back on the spin room. Thanks for sticking around. Still with Moad Khatib, Ruti Bloom, and Adi Schwartz. Adi, I kind of, uh, before we went to a break, kind of cut you off. I want you to finish your thoughts. Right. I think that we have to see the bigger picture again because every two, three years we have a war in Gaza and we keep trying to uh, solve the problem with band aid instead of trying to fix the problem How from its roots. Go ahead. How do you fix it? What is it? You dismantle UNRWA. You explain to these people that they're not refugees and it's time to get real. It's time to uh, resettle, it's time to build their houses and their lives. And what about lifting the siege? That's something else, but we can, that you, you must, uh, every action of building a, an, a port or uh, reconstructing Gaza should be conditioned on mm. stopping refugee status. They're not uh, refugees. Really quickly. Uh, also, you use the word siege. Yes. Excuse me, uh, it's a siege against weapons, particularly from Iran, from entering Gaza. Israel sends hundreds of truckloads of humanitarian goods into Gaza every single day. And what's more, Gaza has a border with Egypt, not only with True. Israel. Egypt is also part of this closure. Uh, indeed. I mean, sadly, I must admit that. But, uh, but Palestinians aren't on the fences there, are they? Sorry? Palestinians aren't riding on the fences of Egypt. Yeah, because who is imposing siege upon them is Israel, not Egypt. But, but you just said that Egypt was also as well imposing the siege. Yeah, but the occupy, occupying power in their eyes, the, the country that invaded their lands and confiscated their territories is Israel, not Egypt. Now, not concerning right. the money that Adi spoke about, okay, let's assume for the, for, for the sake of argument that there's indeed a lot of money that comes into Gaza, but they, ca they can't buy anything without it. Yesterday, uh, uh, a convoy of uh, physicians without borders carrying only medicine wasn't allowed by Israel to enter the Gaza. Really quickly, Adi. Question, what lands does Israel occupy right now in Gaza? What, for, in, in, for, for these people, uh, uh, some of the parts that Israel was established on uh, so the state of Israel within the 1967 Again, borders. I'm explaining the No, I just want to know. I just want to know. Okay, so that's before, you, before you move on, I want to ask one more question before we move on to our next topic. Uh, uh, how do you think Israel is looking internationally these days? Because looking at the media and the international media, it seems that the Palestinian narrative is the one that's being adopted, that Israel is using excessive force. Isn't that right? That's absolutely right, but thank God Trump is in the White House and finally we have a president who is not accusing Israel of being uh, the perpetrator of all this mess. Ruth, uh, Adi, sorry. Well, I think that this is really lamentable because the international community told Israel that you must withdraw from territories that you occupied in 1967 mm -hmm. and then everything will be all right. At least for the Gaza Strip, that's exactly what mm -hmm. happened. And now the fence, the border actually, yes. is contested all of a sudden. No, it's not contested. That's the border. And each one which calls it a massacre or everything, it's just disqualified itself from raising its voice again. Okay, I want to move on to our next topic. That is Israel and Turkey. It's been labeled a diplomatic game of tit for tat, but there was nothing diplomatic about the accusations and insults between Ankara and Jerusalem over the past 48 hours. It all began when Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan decided to recall the ambassadors to the U.S. and to Israel in the wake of the opening of the American embassy in Jerusalem and Israel's handling of the Gaza border riots. He then decided to expel the Israeli ambassador in Ankara, Eitan Nae. Israel responded by asking the Turkish consul in Jerusalem to leave the country. This led the Turkish foreign ministry to summon Israel's consul general in Istanbul and ask him to leave the country. The tensions peaked today with the footage published that we're seeing right now on the screen showing Naed, the Israeli ambassador in Ankara, going through a very strict security check at the airport, uh, airport in front of Turkish media cameras, which were especially invited to cover his departure. And throughout this, Erdogan traded barbs with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, as the former called Israel a terrorist state, and the latter calling Erdogan a Hamas supporter who well understands terrorism and slaughter. Has this spiraled, uh, spiraled out of control? When was it ever under control? Uh, the only time, listen, Erdogan is an Islamist tyrant who um, imprisons uh, everyone in his country who opposes him. Judges, police, journalists, academics. Erdogan is someone who sent, uh, who was responsible for the Mavi Marmara incident, the, Ga the Free Gaza Flotilla incident in 2010 um, that caused the main rupture of relations between Israel and Turkey. And in the meantime, Israel paid Turkey millions of dollars and issued an apology and everything. Yeah. Turkey has done nothing. Um, Was that a mistake, by the aggressive. way, to sign that deal? Oh, absolutely yeah. a mistake. Muad, does, does a, a ruthless autocrat like Recep Tayyip Erdogan, as a man who jails journalists and people who voice opposition, just like uh, Ruthie said, does, does he have uh, the moral high ground to come and preach to Israel? Well, it's fascinating that Ruthie is showing such a great pride 
in Trump, who is a chauvinist, who described women as animals, and at the same time claiming that the elected president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is a tyrant. Now, concerning this, I, 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 I consider it whole, you know, a, a play of politics. Uh, Erdogan wants to show his people that he's a strong nationalist, supported a supporter of Muslims and Arabs and the cause, and I, I understand that. But you mustn't also forget that Israel, uh, Turkey, sorry, understand very much the security concerns of Israel. I myself was once delayed by the Turkish Airlines at the airport for two hours and I, was, I almost missed my plane yeah. to Israel mm -hmm. because Turkey understands Israel's interests. So he's Why his, doesn't his... Israel understand that the Turkish people also believe in certain causes like yeah. the Palestinian cause and they want to support the human rights of Palestinians? Well, I agree with both. Ruthie, just I have to, I have to add to that. that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Ruthie, you just uh, forgot to mention that he has some Kurdish blood on his hands, Syrian blood on his hands because he's involved in the war. That's one. By the way, Adi, to be fair, these humiliation techniques aren't solely uh, Turkish. We've seen here in Israel uh, the foreign uh, deputy foreign minister in the past do some humiliating himself to the Turkish ambassador. Remember putting him on a Back lower, lower chair? Yes. Lower, yes. When, we are, when we are talking about the record of human rights and how do you treat other people while fighting, fighting them than participating in the Syrian civil war and bombing Kurdish villages is in a very different, uh, it's a different level. level. In yeah. a different level. But I agree with Moa that it's politics. I think personally that Erdogan is a clown and he just needs, he, he's such, like a child who needs attention. And he's doing and, it for his base. I think that's what, kind of what uh, Moa exactly. was saying. For yeah, his, I, to I make agree. Points with, to make points with, with Muslim countries, right? To gain and not to, only that. I mean, the guy is an intelligent person and he wants to show his own positions as a world leader. But you do agree he's, he's a ruthless an anti autocrat. He's no, an anti I didn't say that. You don't agree he's an autocrat? No, I mean, Turkey doesn't have records and reports files against, uh, filed against it by amnesty. It's like a democracy? Israel. It's a democracy? Like Israel. Right. Well, well, to it some used extent, to be a yes. democracy, and some Erdogan extent. turned it into an, a non-democracy. What's more, do you realize that Erdogan imprisons people who even say that there was an Armenian genocide in Turkey? He's not somebody who Turkey is doesn't talking on behalf of his... detention like Israel does. Turkey doesn't even have it. No. Israel, there are many prisoners who are held administratively without, without being tried, without even uh, 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 being you know, accused in court. What? Can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. Where would you prefer to spend the night in an Israeli prisoner in a Turkish prison. Well, why does it matter? I mean, wh no, why, why do you have to compare that to Turkey? Why don't it compare to a German? It was, by the way, it's a good or segue to my next question, Ruthie. I'm glad you brought the, the uh, Armenian Holocaust because today the Transportation and Intelligence Minister Israel Katz said there is no quote there is no moral and historical reason not to acknowledge the Armenian Holocaust in reference to this rising tension between Israel and Turkey. Is that a good idea? It's, it's, first of all, it's a very good idea. Israel should have acknowledged the Armenian genocide a long time ago, and it would have, but that was politics, or more accurately, diplomacy. There were reasons that Israel wanted not to antagonize Turkey, by, because if the one thing the Turkish yeah. government cannot abide is to hear that uh, Turkey committed a genocide against uh, the Armenians. Same question, good idea. I think there should be a very careful calculation, because there are uh, economic interests and military interests. I don't think that you have to decide if this or that did a genocide just by that uh, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. There are many interests and uh, a wise Israeli policy would take that into consideration. I just think that the less you, you acknowledge this uh, president, it's the be it's better. The less you don't, okay. Yeah. We have to go for another commercial. Less attention. <laughs> less attention. <laughs> we'll be right back with Ruti Boom, Muad Khatib and Adi Schwartz. Stick around. Spin Room with Ruthie Bloom, Muad Khatib, and Adi Schwartz. And we're moving on to our next topic. The uh, violence in Gaza is also reverberating inside Israel. Arab Israelis held a general strike today to protest Monday's violence, where 61 Palestinians were killed on the Gaza border. Arab Israeli businesses and public schools went on strike, which was called by the Higher Arab Monitoring Committee uh, in Israel. What is this uh, strike uh, hoping to achieve, Muad? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's uh, a sign of sympathy mm. with uh, our fellow Palestinian people who live in Gaza. Uh, simply, people were killed, were massacred in cold blood. And it is our humanitarian uh, uh, obligation to, so, to show sympathy with them exactly the same way that we show sympathy with Jews who were killed by the Nazi regime. Mm. Ruthie, do you think these uh, events in Gaza will, will deepen the divide? between uh, Arabs here uh, in Israel and, and the Jews living in Israel as well? Again, you know, 
th when there's a divide that is, has been deep all along, it's not going to deepen anymore. It's already deep. Uh, the, not but all when Arab have Israelis... High, such high death tolls. Not all Arab, not all Arab Israeli citizens um, have ex expressed solidarity with Palestinians and certainly not with terrorists. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question of whether this deepens a divide, I think it just reiterates a divide that was already there with the more radical elements of the Arab-Israeli population. All shops were closed today. All shops. No, almost all towns. Well, listen, I would want to So you are saying be... that Arabs in Israel support terrorists in Gaza, and you are again no. using the wrong term. No, I'm saying Labeling that the leadership... children as no. terrorists. No, no. I actually think that uh, many Arab-Israeli citizens uh, follow their leaders, try to radicalize them. Again, I think the people tend to be moderate on all sides of this issue and the it's the leadership uh, that um, kind of incites the people to violence. Would you agree and by the way with what Ruthie said Moad, that there, 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 it's not unison there, there is critique uh, in Arab society in Israel against uh, of Hamas and how it handles things in Gaza there is right? Well, not the, I mean, okay, the thing is not what their position on Hamas is, okay. but what their position on killing innocent people is. Okay. Their position is clear. We are against killing innocent people everywhere. In Gaza, in, inside Israel, in Syria. Are you against killing people in Syria? Yeah, of course you are. I just Why are you with killing with people? Why are you suddenly people? describing people in Gaza as terrorists simply because Hamas the terrorists. people on the other side are Israeli soldiers? Because they didn't Hamas, carry arms. Hamas they, they is were a civilian. terrorist organization. Were, what about the people? What about, you can't say Hamas that. sent those Hamas. people there to uh, get killed. Okay, wait, wait. Not clear. Even if they did, does that give him a legitimacy to kill them? Them. Well, if they're, well, they're, 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 uh, they're uh, committing an act of aggression. What kind of aggression? They, what, they are just, you know, assembling at the border. Is that aggression? That's a question that, you know, I've asked a few uh, times and I'll ask you yes. as well. Are these people on the fence? It's a really simple question. Two words. Are they rioters? Or protesters. Yes. They're rioters and they sent Molotov cocktails on kites. They were rioters. rioting and protesters. Yes, rioters. They are rioters. Yes. What about Ethiopians who protested in Tel Aviv? Did they give the Israeli police a right to kill them because they were rioters? It's not the same thing. Okay, so uh, because the same they are not Arabs. Because because no, not because you are not killing Arabs. Arabs. No. Okay. No, 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 no. Ethiopians is a different no. thing. Okay. No, no. Khatib, right. go ahead, Adi. There is no border. The, the, the uh, issue of running to a border and trying to cross it is obvious, is simple. Everybody in all the world would be shot simply. When 40,000 people run to the border, that's not, that's not rioters, that's terrorists, that's even more than that. That's all those 40,000 people are terrorists? If they try to cross all, all the border, all those 40,000 people are terrorists? If they try to cross the border, they are fighters. And no other country would allow a fighter to cross the border, mm -hmm. period. Well, why don't you compare it to Hungary? When Syrian refugees try to cross the borders. How, how many of them were killed? None. Listen. Where, Answer to that, when, please. When Why somebody, don't you comment on that? When 40,000 people run to the border and try to cross That's exactly it, what happened. They In are fact, being it was shot. more than hundreds of thousands. They were not nation. trying to infiltrate. And this, were, and this exactly was an enemy did. act. No. That's exactly what they, they were did. fleeing. They crossed the borders without permission. Exactly like people in Gaza. Why weren't they shot and killed? Um, I would like to know why don't you ask that question, I don't understand why you're defending um, terrorists who kill Arabs. Again, you're describing them as terrorists. I mean, children, 14 and 15 years old. Come again, on. Again, again, I think that this whole discussion is absurd because we have here a population of 2 million people who do not recognize the right of Israel to exist. They don't want any Jews. As, as Moad just said, they, they think that the whole of the state of Israel is occupied. Yeah. So what the discussion? First, let them recognize my right to stay here and be free in my country, and then we can discuss other things. Are you somewhat surprised, Moad, that there, you know, the, prote the protests here inside Israel, uh, Palestinians in, in Israel, weren't uh, more harsh or more even sometimes, it's been violent in the past. What do you mean? You were throwing rocks. This was a fairly subtle, shall I say, uh, protest. By no, I mean, I have to part in almost all protests, and uh, um, uh, every time there was violence, it was uh, started by the Israeli police. I can mm. say that 
Is that why maybe it was more calm? Because there, there was a fear of, 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 of what the Israeli police, how they would respond? No, no. I mean, yesterday in Tel, in Tel Aviv, uh, sorry, two days ago, uh, at the opening of the new embassy, yes. I mean, there were hundreds who protested. Outside the, uh, the ceremony in Jerusalem, yes. Exactly, yes, yes. yes. And did you see anyone throw a stone? 14 no. people were arrested? Exactly. Yes. They were attacked. They were assaulted <coughs> by the police. Many mm -hmm. were arrested, although not one even single stone was thrown. Did you want to? Re I thought you want to react to that, sir, Ruthie. <laughs> um, no, what I wanted to say uh, to uh, refer seconds. to something I said before, and that is, let us remember why Israel disengaged from Gaza in the first place, and that was that there was a suicide bombing war going on against innocent Israelis every single day in the Gaza Strip. Uh, uh, no, in, in Israel. In Israel. In Israel. Okay. okay. Yes. 20, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, go ahead. Well, as just Mouad said, the problem is the concept of the Palestinians, that the whole of the land is theirs. It's not about freedom for Palestinians, it's actually about the right of the Jews to self-determination in their country, mm. not the other way around. Okay, we have to go for a commercial break. We'll be right back with Mouad Khatib, Adi Schwartz, and Ruti Bloom. Stick around. Spinner with Ruthie Bloom, Adi Schwarz, and Mouad Khatib. Let's move on to our last topic. It's not just the U.S. Guatemala has also moved its embassy to Jerusalem, the first country to follow the U.S. lead. The embassy was inaugurated this morning in a ceremony attended by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales. A grateful Netanyahu said at the ceremony that he would visit Guatemala on his trip, his next trip to South America. Let's hear some more from the Prime Minister this morning. Guatemala is opening its uh, embassy in Jerusalem right among the first. You were always among the first. Yeah. Always among the first. You were the second country to recognize Israel, but you had a very important role in this. Another important day, Adi? <clears throat> yes, I think that uh, this should have happened long ago. I think that all of these embassies should have opened in 1949. There's again an absurdity of the international community. The western part of Jerusalem is not contested. And we have now countries who recognize the state of Palestine, have embassies in East Jerusalem such as Sweden, and still have their embassy in Tel Aviv. So they have to decide. If you acknowledge East Jerusalem as the capital of Palestine, then obviously at least your embassy should be in West Jerusalem. So there should be more. Ruthie, do you think we're going to see some more uh, countries uh, follow suit? Yes, I do, because uh, I think that people um, are encouraged and emboldened when uh, the President of the United States takes a really tough stance. What about some major countries, not just Guatemala, like Western European powers or, or Asi Asian powers? Not, not, those, uh, not those European countries that spend all their time delegitimizing Israel. <laughs> that, that won't happen. Mm -hmm. um, spend the time condemning Israel at the United Nations, for example. But I, think, wonder, I, think it's a, quickly. I think it's a really good question, because the question is, what's the their policy. Do they want to uh, enhance the chances of peace? And if they want to enhance the chance of peace... Are you talking the, about the Western European countries? Yes, yes, okay. exactly. But the UK, France, etc. Mm -hmm. Then obviously Western Jerusalem is not contested. So what's the message? By not moving their embassy to Western Jerusalem, they're saying to Israelis that even West Jerusalem is contested. Mm. Well, you know, speaking of uh, messages that are being uh, put out there, the Palestinians today called back their representatives from countries who participated in that dedication ceremony of the U.S., the new U.S. embassy in Jerusalem. We're talking about Czech Republic, uh, Hungary, Romania, and others. This pace, they won't have many friends left soon, will they? Well, but concerning that, I mean, let's first talk about Guatemala, which is probably the second time in my life that I hear such a name. <laughs> I know I don't oh, come know on. where it falls on the map. And Israel is celebrating so greatly, I mean, that Guatemala, Guatemala recognized it or moved its embassy to Jerusalem. What you must seek is the support of, as you just said, uh, the major powers in the world. And those major powers, contrary to what Adi have said, uh, it wa there was a vote in the United Nations Security Council, 14 to 1, people, uh, countries voted against mm -hmm. uh, or actually supported uh, a resolution condemning this move by the United States. Right. That's the international community. Let's talk about that U.S. dedication ceremony. There were some pretty uh, controversial figures there, like uh, Pastor uh, Robert uh, Jeffries, who said that religions like Mormonism, Islam, Hinduism, and Judaism 
not only uh, lead people away from God, they lead people to an eternity of separation from God in hell. Uh, he's also said that Jews uh, can't be saved. Uh, Mitt Romney and uh, former U.S. Ambassador to Israel Daniel Shapiro uh, said that, um, specifically Daniel Shapiro said that Israelis should feel embarrassed that this man was at this uh, ceremony. Uh, Israelis should be embarrassed? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he would have been my choice, but the fact is he's been extremely pro-Israel from a political standpoint all along. But if he said, um, if he said either anti-Semitic things or racial things against other religions, is, is that a person that... Look, I'm not sure his, his quotes are, aren't being taken out of context, because actually what I read is that he did say that Mormonism isn't uh, genuine Christianity, and many that's Christians be, that's think besides that. besides what I just about said. About what he said about the Jews, uh, it's debatable. Jews and can't I don't be saved. Want to, I, I, I don't know if he actually said it that way, but what I know is okay. uh, my Christian friends have said the following. They said, listen, right now uh, we have to worry about supporting Israel. Those who talk about the end of days, listen, we don't even know what's happening next week, and you're worried about the end of days. I don't think we should worry about that. It was a very religious ceremony, wasn't it, Adi? Yeah, in comparison to other ceremonies that we know. The Americans were the organizers. I'm usually not really, I'm not um, uh, <laughs> giving such attention to religious figures, yes. uh, yeah. pastors, rabbis, etc. Uh -huh. So for me, more important was the ceremony itself and less the speeches. Okay, let's wrap it up in the three minutes that we have left. You know, the embassy has moved. Uh, there are no negotiations right now. There's no peace process, as uh, <laughs> Ruthie has liked to tell me all the time. Uh, and nothing happening soon. It looks like the Trump plan, peace plan, isn't going to come out anytime soon. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, had some uh, anti Semitic uh, remarks that he said in the last uh, couple of weeks, and now I'm sure that no Israeli leader will ever want to talk to him until, until he leaves the stage. Where does this leave us, Moana? Yeah, I wanted to comment on that. I mean, let's state, I mean, present facts on the ground. According to international law, this move is completely illegal because the, the, state, the status of Elf Jerusalem is to be determined by the final status negotiations. By this move, Israel and the United States made it clear that they are not interested in any peace talk or any solution. Okay, and where do you see where it's going next? Now, actually, based on this, uh, things are going to get worse if U.S. and Trump, I mean, the Trump administration... Worse means administration, what? More violence? Apparently so, because they are refusing to give people their rights, Palestinians specifically. Actually, appeasement leads to more violence, um, not being firm. We see that again and again and again. And the fact is that when there is a firm president in the White House and not an appeaser of Iran or Hamas or, uh, or Turkey, when you have appeasement, you have war. When you defeat your enemies, then you have a chance for peace. I'm actually quite uh, optimistic. Why? Because um, it's because of the way Trump is handling things, mm, perhaps. But it's not a coincidence that the peace process has failed. The peace process currently is built on a lie, and now perhaps we are trying to say we are starting to say the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is okay. that the Palestinian side refuses to acknowledge Israel's right but to exist. But if nothing happens, doesn't and it until, inevitably, inevitably no, lead to, to a one-state outcome? No. What does it lead to? I, what could it I lead don't to? Think, I don't think How nothing leads... to a continuing wait a second, and wait a second, and nothing, really, 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 Wait a second. Nothing leads to a one-state solution. It will, it's, outcome, not solution. Um, outcome or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that when the Palestinians will get a very clear message, which they didn't get until now, that right. their uh, intransigence will have price, okay. then perhaps they will change the way. Do you want to react quickly? I mean, Ruthie here used to live in an illegal settlement, and uh, she comes here to defend, in what in my opinion, a racist uh, system that uh, is preventing Palestinians from uh, taking the rights and depriving them of the lands, <laughs> really continuing quick. to be built illegal settlements. Really quickly. Hope I can it. just say one thing, quickly. that that illegal settlement, which is called Haradar, that I used to live yeah. in, um, is everybody in it land. is a left-wing Israeli okay. who okay. votes for the, the peace the process. That's all the time we have, guys. Thanks to our panelists, Moa Khatib, Adi Schwartz, and Ruki Bloom. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. We'll be right back with a journalist who grew up in Jerusalem and later wrote a novel that takes place in the Holy City. Stick around. back on the spin room. Thanks for sticking with us. We're going to keep talking a bit more about Jerusalem in this historic week for the city. Very happy to be joined in studio by a native of the Holy City, Israeli journalist and author of the bestseller, The Beauty Queen of Jerusalem, Sarit Ishai Levi. Thank you very much for joining us, Sarit, today. It's good to Thank have you. Thank you for inviting me. So you were born uh, in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yes. Do, do you still call yourself a Jerusalemite? No, no, no. definitely not. Why not? I'm actually, I'm eight generations in Jerusalem. My so family, you're a real Jerusalemite if it's eight generations. Yeah, 
But ever since I know myself, I, and uh, ever since I'm 20, in, I live in Tel Aviv, so I call myself a Tel Avivian, and I'm very much a Tel Avivian, much less a Jerusalemian. But what's interesting is that when I came to write my first novel, mm -hmm. instead of writing about my uh, natural, uh, you know, uh, place, which was uh, which, which was Tel Aviv by that yeah. time, of mm -hmm. course, and, and even now. Yeah, I find myself write, writing about Jerusalem, which to show you that so, the roots are strong than anything else. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Why you did it? Why you did it in Jerusalem? But first, here's the novel, the, the, the Beauty yeah. Queen of Jerusalem. So That's the American it. version. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we broadcast in America. So Absolutely. Great. Tell me a bit more about the book. What's it about? Yeah. Well, the book is uh, about uh, four generations of women in Jerusalem mm -hmm. in a Sephardic family, but I must uh, uh, insist to tell you what kind of a Sephardic family. It's not an Oriental family. You know, we call in Israel, we now call all the people who came from the Oriental countries, we call them Sephardim. Yes. But this is a really an original Sephardic family. In Hebrew, we call them Samech uh, Tet which means pure Sephardic. Ah, the family okay. <laughs> of my book, and also my family, come from Toledo, actually. In Spain. In Spain, and they, they live generations in Jerusalem. And the book follow the four generation of women. It starts in the 19th century. Are they speaking and, Ladino, or is it...? The, the people are Latino spoken, of course. This right, community okay. are, are Latino spoken. Yes. I don't speak Latino because. You don't, okay. But, uh, but these people spoke Latino, right. which is the Sephar uh, Sephardic Yiddish. You yes, know? the Sephardic Yiddish, yeah. that's right. So it starts in the 19th century, actually, mm -hmm. during the Ottoman days. Okay. And then it goes through the British time, mm -hmm. and then it goes to the um, uh, underground town uh, uh, time. Uh, and all the all the independent war until the mid 70s of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So it follows uh, the most important events that actually ha happened in Israel it's during really this time. Yeah. And but what was the trigger for writing this book? Why did you why did you decide th this topic? And, and why did you decide, like I asked before, to to have it in Jerusalem and not uh, in Tel Aviv? I didn't decide. It decided for me. It just it just yeah. came, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I started to write and. Uh, it's true. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm writing about Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm writing about times b much more before I was born, and the, the language there. If, when you read the, the book in Hebrew, mm -hmm. it's a very ancient Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Hebrew with a, a broken Hebrew with the Ladino words, and I don't speak any Ladino. And I, I had a feeling as if someone is sitting here in my in my shoulder and is whispering to me, you know, <laughs> what to write. Well, it was a very inspire. I, I was inspired so much. I don't know by what, but uh, yeah. So let's talk about uh, you know a little about the city. I mean, you said that you left when you were twenty. After my army service. After the army service, yeah. left your twenty. Um, well, I mean, I know a lot of people who have who have left uh, Jerusalem. Is this still is the city still a place you know for people like you who are secular Jews? Why why did you leave when you after the army service? It was too heavy for me, you know. Jerusalem too heavy. back Jer then. You, yeah, because I was I was a child before the Six Day War, and the and the time Jerusalem was different until the Six Day War. Can you, can you elaborate about? Yeah, the, uh, it was a very small city first of all, only the west side. Most of the the people knew each other. It wasn't an Orthodox city at all. Secular, more secular than it is today. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We hardly saw the the, the, the Orthodox, uh, you know, the the hard Orthodox. Ultra Orthodox. The ultra Orthodox, what you called, yes, Jews hardly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very open-minded kind of city. You know, it was influenced by the students of the Hebrew University. It was influenced by the Bezalel uh, Art Institute. One of the most famous art institutes, uh, the most famous art institute in the country. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and also, it was it was a Bohemian city, mm. and it was very uh, a pluralistic kind of city. And what is it today? How would you describe it today? A chaos city. A chaos city. <laughs> it's uh, like uh, in Hebrew we say tohu Yeah. Yeah. Um, whenever I come to Jerusalem, I always, you know, you don't know what to look for. So many people, so many cultures, so many dreams, so many, everything of too much, you know. So it's 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 like uh, there's there's no peace in this city. And yeah, there's no the tranquility, is there? No. Mm. Yeah, and, and there was a tranquility when I was a child. Mm. And there was a very good relationship between religious people and non-religious people. Mm -hmm. In my building, we were mixed. Some pe some families were religious, some not, like mine. Mm -hmm. And we really lived together. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. When I come to Jerusalem now, I like have a headache sometimes. Really, that bad.
We only have a few minutes left, but I want to talk to you about something from, from, from your past, which I found fascinating. One of the first Israeli journalists, or the first, shall I say, to interview Yasser Arafat in 1982 in the first uh, Lebanon war. We have a picture of that. That's, that's when you met him, yeah. together with the other two uh, other journalists that, that were with you. I must say the names. You that know? was 36. That was uh, Anat Sargusti and uh, Uri Avneri. Anat Sargusti was the photographer. photographer. Uri Avneri was, was my editor. The editor of, uh, of, uh, of uh, How Lama Zay, yeah. This World, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, if you could tell us a little bit about, about that meeting and also, uh, really quickly, what has changed and what has not changed oh. since there, since 1982? A lot changed. If you want to start with change, everything changed. The mm. hope changed. There's no, no hope now There's for no hope me. Now? No, I'm I'm very pessimistic now. Mm -hmm. When we met Arafat, there was still hope. And after that, you know, with the Oslo and the and the Rabin and the and the peace treatment and everything, there was a lot of hope. Did moving the U.S. embassy to the city that you were born in did that not give you hope? Not only did it not give me hope, I don't feel Is something special about it. Really? I mean, if it creates such a such a balagan, such a hatred, a mess, a such a mess. Yeah. If it creates such a problems, I don't know. I mean, this statement could wait until the peace. Until the peace achieved. Uh, yeah. So but, you, uh, you don't see a, a, a peace agreement that has a, a, a united Jerusalem under uh, Israeli sovereignty, all of Jerusalem under Israel. It's just. I think we try now for almost 50 years. Yeah. to unite the city. Yeah. Almost 50 years, it yeah. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be an Israeli, they want to be Palestinians. Right. You can't force someone to be what he doesn't want to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying who is right and who is wrong, this is not the place for me to say it. I'm just saying, you, we didn't want the, to become British, we didn't want the British here. We fight against the, the British, now they fight, fight against, against, us. against us. You know, you. You can understand it or not, but that's the situation, that's the situation. and it's not easy. Sarit Ishai Levy, thank you very much for coming and sharing your insights with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. We'll be right back with Raviv Reveals and Washington Bureau Chief Dan Raviv. Stick around. We're back on the spin room, and now it's time to go to our Washington Bureau Chief. It's time for Raviv Reveals with Dan Raviv. Dan, it's good to see you. How are you doing? My pleasure. Hi, Ami. I want to talk to you about that dedication ceremony that we saw on Monday of the new U.S. Embassy uh, in Jerusalem. I want to ask you, you know, of course you're in D.C., what does it mean for internal U.S. politics, specifically for President Donald Trump? It's hugely important for Trump. A lot of people may not realize that, but look who was in the front row. Not only his daughter Ivanka, her husband Jared Kushner, both of them officially White House advisors. The only member of the Trump cabinet was a Jewish man, Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary. Mm -hmm. And right next to him, Sheldon Adelson and his Israeli-American wife, Miri. Sheldon Adelson from Las Vegas, the casino mogul who's become one of the largest donors to the Republican Party. I mean, as I see it, as that ceremony unfolded, it was like a Republican pro-Trump pep rally, so good for Trump. And if Adelson was happy, that means there will be a ton of money going to the Trump re-election campaign in 2020. And here's an angle you may not have realized. Adelson can also shut up Republican candidates who might be running away from Trump. Republicans who are running for office and decide they're not with Trump because Trump's a little bit too vulgar or, or unstable. And Adelson would tell them, you want my contribution? You're going to stand with Trump. Trump is the guy who recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and move the embassy, keeping his promise. Adelson is now saying, Trump's my guy. It's a powerful thing in U.S. politics. And that's, an, that's enough, Dan, to, to make him, to, to let him win uh, the 2020 presidential election? Well, money is very important in American politics. And add to that now that Christian evangelicals will be solidly behind Trump. Now, now in general, they voted for him in 2016, but often they've done it with this reluctance because he's a man who almost certainly cheated on his wife and has not been you know, the absolute icon of morality, and yet still Christian evangelicals have been voting for him. Now, now that he fulfilled what's so important to them, having the capital of Israel in Jerusalem, you saw the two noteworthy speakers at that ceremony, both of them very pro-Israel uh, evangelical Christian preachers, uh, Hagee and Jeffress. Uh, you know, they're controversial here. Liberal American Jews don't like them, but the Christian evangelicals do, and they live in key states for Trump. Uh, you combine all that and then the Democrats so far not having a candidate for president in 2020 it sure does look good for Trump in that year Ami. 
I agree. But and speaking about you know political the, the futures of, of, of individuals, um, Nikki Haley, the United States ambassador at the UN, you know, uh, was at that Security Council meeting yesterday, walking out as the Palestinian representative uh, began to talk. Those are also images, right, that could help her politically for her political future. Well, I'm pretty sure she's not going to challenge her president in 2020, but the year 2024 would be the next presidential election. There are Americans who want to have the first female president. Hillary Clinton got more votes than Donald Trump, but not in the key states that add up in the Electoral College. And so she came close, Hillary did. Nikki Haley, Republican, conservative, former governor of South Carolina, uh, she wants it. You can just feel it. And for now, she's building up her image. She's also being loyal to Trump. But but she's being a hero to a lot of certainly conservative Americans who want the U.S. to take a tough stand, and she does that at the U.N. in New York, Ami. And what is the, what is the political debate over Gaza, especially the last, you know, very heated days, particularly Monday, over Gaza? What does it look like in the U.S.? How strong are the voices, particularly from the progressive left, the Jewish left on this issue, who are, you know, usually critical of Israeli policies anyway? Inevitably, the conversation is focused on Monday, the so-called split screen, two stories at the same time, that happy celebration, especially for pro-Trump right-wingers in Jerusalem, and at the same time, Palestinians being shot dead uh, on the Gaza frontier. Now, most American Jews are liberals, and if they look at this situation, they don't like Trump. They usually do like the idea that the embassy's in Jerusalem, but not if Trump did it with all those evangelical preachers. And then as for the killings on the Gaza frontier, a lot of progressive or liberal Jews say something must be wrong. As the Reform Judaism movement in the U.S. said in an official statement, um, the embassy should be in Jerusalem. But in Gaza, though Israel has every right to defend itself and the IDF is clearly doing what it can, there must be a better way. It doesn't have to be like this. Live fire, killing so many people. By the way, uh, you know, hurting Israel's image all around the world. Israel's now facing another round of global condemnation. And you have American liberal Jews uncomfortable about Israeli actions. That's a difficult thing, and Israeli leaders ought to be aware. It's, it's partisan here now. Republicans tend to love Israel more than Democrats do, but most Jews are Democrats. Mm -hmm. There's a problem with this. It's not fitting, Ami. Definitely. Israel and Jerusalem becoming more and more a partisan issue. Dan Raviv and Raviv Reveal segment. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week, Dan. See ya. <laughs> uh, see ya. That's it. I hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks for taking a ride with us on The Spin Room. Hope you hop on again tomorrow, 6 p.m. Tel Aviv, 8 p.m. New York. In the meantime, hang in there.